Hello there, my name is Dr. Asim Hussain. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Thank you for joining today. Today I shall be talking to you about facial nerve palsy. Now, facial nerve palsy is a very big topic. Uh, you know, we could talk about this for hours. It's an, it's an interest of mine. And um, but what I'll try to do is do, cover some of the fundamental uh, things I, should, I think you should know about. So the very first thing to say about facial nerve palsy is that you must differentiate uh, Bell's palsy versus the other causes of facial nerve palsy. Uh, not all facial nerve palsy is Bell's palsy. And the reason that's important is because it can be some very serious underlying pathology causing the patient's facial nerve palsy, which needs to be investigated. And you know that may not have been done before the patient saw you, so be aware of that. Another important factor to be aware of is upper motor, upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. Now I'll leave you to in investigate what are the differences clinically. Uh, there's one fundamental difference uh, in, how, in, in the patient presentation, because if there is an upper motor ne neuron disorder, of course the patient will need uh, more investigation. So I'll be talking to you about briefly about how you establish the diagnosis, the epidemiology, uh, then running through the presentation, and, and of course, how we manage these patients, uh, and giving you some examples of some of the patients I've managed. So let me just talk about, before I come to the next slide, about Bell's palsy. So by far, that's the commonest presentation uh, uh, of facial nerve palsy. Bell's palsy is, is, is also termed idiopathic facial paralysis because we're not sure as to what causes it, but there is a belief that it is caused by the herpes simplex virus. The history is that the patient presents with a rapid onset under 72 hours of a, of a unilateral, usually facial uh, paralysis. Uh, it is more common in the ages between 15 and 45 uh, uh, years old. More common apparently in those with diabetes, uh, patients who are uh, immunocompromised, and also a higher prevalence in, in pregnant patients. And we wrote a paper, wrote a paper on Bell's, uh, Bell's facial nerve palsy in pregnancy, published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. The important thing is that these patients usually recover fairly quickly. Uh, you know, we, we usually say a, a sort of a rough marker of three months that there should have been at least some improvement. And 70 to 80% of these patients recover spontaneously. But some patients uh, can take more than three months to recover. However, be aware, of course, that the longer a patient has signs of FNP, and with no recovery, the more likely that you should probably be investigating them uh, with imaging at least. Um, Bell's palsy is rarely bilateral uh, and um, uh, I should say that it, it, Bell's palsy encompasses about 50% of all cases of FNP. Uh, where, and a study recently done um, uh, showed that out of 2,000 facial palsy patients treated at a clinic, Bell's palsy accounted for about 38% of those cases. And those patients are usually treated with uh, a combination of uh, corticosteroid therapy uh, and sometimes also antivirals. But uh, institution of uh, steroids is very important uh, for, uh, for Bell's palsy. What are other causes of facial nerve palsy? Well, infection. Bacterial infections, including otitis media, otitis externa, and mastoiditis can result in facial nerve palsy, and you should be aware of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Uh, Lyme's disease, Lyme disease, in Nova Scotia, we're aware that there's a higher uh, prevalence of that, so we always ask about uh, Borrelia burgdorferi causing um, Lyme disease and secondary uh, facial nerve palsy. It accounts for about 10% of all cases. But be, do know that 25% of Lyme, case, Lyme disease cases causing uh, Bell's, sorry, causing facial nerve palsy are bilateral. Um, so coming back to Ramsey Hunt, uh, a facial nerve palsy occurring in association with a painful fascicular eruption uh, is usually the presentation of Ramsey Hunt. And uh, these patients are often in considerable pain and are less responsive to therapy. Other infections include diphtheria, HIV, varicella, mumps, uh, leprosy. Trauma can do it. Um, blunt or penetrating trauma of the, of the uh, temporal bone, which can cause fracture, can result in FNP, and direct facial nerve injury, of course, through trauma or surgery. And then, of course, coming to surgery, 
iatrogenic causes. You know, resection of CPA tumors can cause uh, multiple cranial nerve uh, pathologies, including the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth nerve. And this highlights an important point that if you see a patient with a seventh nerve palsy, check at least their fifth to their uh, eighth nerves uh, because they may have a concomitant um, uh, multi-cranial nerve uh, pathology, which may have been missed by other practitioners and important to know. Neoplastic uh, disorders, uh, that can be divided into central or nuclear lesions, so such as those occurring in the brainstem or the pons or the CPA, such as acoustic neuroma, uh, the external auditory canal or the parotid gland, those are classified as central lesions. And then peripheral lesions, uh, depending on its presentation, again, affecting the parotid gland, the facial nerve in it, uh, itself, such as a schwannoma, uh, lymphoma can also infiltrate uh, uh, the facial nerve. Inflammatory causes, sarcoidosis, vasculitis, and then you have a myriad of other rare etiologies like congenital facial paralysis, which is also known as uh, Mobius syndrome, <clears throat> excuse me, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome, which also affects the, the tongue, uh, diabetes, infarction of the nerve, and pontine, pontine demyelination. So we mentioned quickly about uh, uh, epidemiology. Um, uh, you should know that one in 60 to 70 people are affected, uh, I beg your pardon, it affects one in 60 to 70 people in a lifetime. And it peaks between the ages of 10 to 40, affects men and women equally. Trauma accounts for about 25% of cases. We've already talked about the classic uh, presentation of Bell's palsy in that it's fairly quick, um, dramatic onset and recovery usually occurs gradually. Um, but if there are other features in the history, such as a slower onset or other cranial nerve involvement, uh, then of course be, be uh, alert to those. Imaging is recommended uh, in the following uh, uh, patients, those in whom you are uh, suspicious of other diagnoses, of course, such as a stroke or tumor or head trauma. If you are seeing multiple cranial nerve involvement, if it's recurrent, if it's bilateral, if they're not involving over three to four weeks, if they have a complete paralysis, have a low threshold for, um, for uh, investigation. I mean, they may, they should usually be some movement of the face. Um, and if they're progressing rather than improving. So if, if the patient says, well, it started like this, uh, you know, I couldn't move my, let's say eye, but then I couldn't move my mouth or forehead, and so it, it sort of denotes that there is some progression, then that you know, should be investigated. How do the patients present? Uh, well, in terms of uh, ophthalmic signs, these are the things, of course, we worry about. We worry about uh, exposure keratopathy, vision loss, lower eyelid ectropion. The patient may complain of tearing, and the patient may also, if they've had the, the condition for a while, have developed aberrant regeneration and synkinesis. But as you look at the patient, they may have uh, loss, ha loss of the forehead wrinkling. They may have brow ptosis. They are unable to close their eyes completely. They may have drooping or drooling uh, at the mouth. Uh, they may have uh, uh, jaw pain. Ask about taste, tearing, and hearing. So that is an important question because if a patient presents with ringing in their ears, that might actually guide you as to the location of the insult on the nerve and that actually can be related to whether the lacrimal uh, branch of the facial nerve has been involved and uh, sometimes can affect the prognosis with, the, with regards to the um, kerat keratopathy. So very interesting question to ask. Um, so look, you know, do a complete of course slit lamp examination, look for uh, punctate epitheliopathy, always check corneal sensation. A patient may have coexisting uh, a neurotrophic keratopathy. And if that is missed early on, these patients will do much, much worse. And of course, their management may also be different if they have a, um, a neurotrophic keratopathy as well. The patient will have an incomplete blink, uh, leg ophthalmos, and they may also have a paralytic ectropion that is commonly found. Uh, there are grading systems for a facial nerve palsy you should be aware of such as the Sunnybrook uh, grading system and the, and the CADS system uh, by one of my uh, uh, trainers in the UK. 
you should be aware of. Patients can develop aberrant facial uh, nerve re -innervation. Usually occurs after a few months of the facial nerve palsy being present. Again, if they do develop this, you may want to uh, investigate them. Uh, we know that, for example, in third nerve palsies, uh, you know, the presence of aberrant regeneration is, is a, uh, is a, it gives you a high suspicion of a compressive cause to their third nerve uh, palsy. How do uh, aberrant aberrant re innervation patients present. Usually there are three fundamental ways. Hypertonicity, so the affected site actually starts to become more contracted uh, despite decreased dynamic function. Um, compared to the normal side, the affected side starts to look more tight. Uh, they may get uh, uh, synkinesis, so when they move the lower face, their eyelid starts to move or vice versa. When they blink, their mouth can twitch. And gustatory lacrimation, also known as crocodile tears, when uh, fibers to the sublingual and uh, mandibular glands also re innervate the lacrimal gland so that the patient starts to cry when they're chewing their food. And these, uh, these, uh, these findings can be very successfully treated with onobotulinum toxin injections. And we, we often do those injections in clinic. So initially, the patient, how are they managed? Well, it's usually done through. Um, uh, conservative management, you know, with, uh, with um, uh, artificial tears, with humidification of their bedroom, with taping at night if required. Uh, you may want to use a bandage contact lens in the early phases. Um, uh, you want to assess their Bell's phenomenon. I, I did not mention that in the examination. It's very important. And uh, the House Brackman's guide or House Brackman grade is very useful in grading how severe the ophthalmic signs are. So it goes from one to one to six. One is normal blink and eyelid closure. Two is full eyelid closure with minimal effort. Three is full eyelid closure with maximal effort. Four is incomplete closure of the eyelids with normal facial symmetry. Five is incomplete closure with facial asymmetry. And six is absolutely no eyelid movement. And I'll leave you to look up the Sunnybrook grading system, which I already mentioned to you. Um, and these grading systems can be useful to gu help guide how, how uh, aggressive your initial management will be. So when you're looking at the patient, you're going to be assessing how good their static and their dynamic function is. So when you look at the patient, how are they just at rest? And how are they when they're moving their face? And also you will be asked, you know, you will ask, be asking the patient about their, their symptoms. But, you know, older patients may have less of a... Uh, 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 expectation in terms of uh, what surgeries they want. Younger patients, you may want to consider referring them early for dynamic procedures to your colleagues. And this is an, an area of interest of mine uh, with regards to dynamic procedures. So the risk factors for FNP, I'll just cover, uh, they vary by the etiology that we've mentioned before, but we know that immunocompromised patients are uh, at higher risk as are patients who are pregnant. Uh, we've mentioned uh, differential diagnoses, and uh, I'll just come to finally management. So, you know, we mentioned that uh, conservative management is important. Uh, be more concerned if there's a patient has decreased corneal sensation. Um, you will want to do aggressive lubrication of the ocular surface. Preservative, artificial, preservative free artificial tears are usually advised because the patient needs to put in a drop. Uh, more than four times a day and in those situations you should use a preservative free drop thicker gels or ointments moisture retention like a set of a humidifiers taping the eyes consider punctal plugs in fact in some patients if they benefit from those consider uh, punctal cautery improving the tear film quality so warm compresses uh, lipid enhanced artificial tears supplementation with uh, fish and flaxseed oil if you think they have associated blepharitis and uh, evaporative uh, dry eye, <clears throat> then uh, using doxycycline, uh, and you may want to consider other, uh, other therapies which are uh, now, now available. Um, contact lenses, which can be bandaged soft contact lenses. And I've also sent patients for scleral contact lenses uh, when they've done uh, not so well from uh, surgery or do not want to have surgery. So in this patient, uh, I don't have a picture of her pre-op. She actually had very significant exposure keratopathy. 
but I performed an upper lid gold weight, uh, which is a loading treatment. So this is a temporary, uh, usually a temporary upper lid weight, but can be permanent. Um, uh, you can actually have some weights taped to the skin uh, called blink ease, uh, which are available in some places. Uh, or you can place the weight in the eyelid, which is what this patient has. They can be made of, of gold or platinum. Um, you can consider bottom toxin. You can consider hyaluronic acid gels. Uh, you can consider also temporary tarsorophies in the, in the office uh, room if you feel that it's uh, urgent. And, you know, glue tarsorophies have also been described. Um, so in her, I did an upper lid gold weight, but I also did a lower lid sling running from the medial uh, orbital wall to the lateral uh, orbital rim. Uh, and that was in a subciliary plane uh, using Vicryl. You can see that sort of uh, line in her lower lid where the lid is running. Um, and that gave, it's almost like a hammock being anchored up toward the eye. As it was tightened, it brought the lid up and gave her an excellent position. And I find that is an, a very, a, a, an excellent uh, procedure, which I usually combine uh, with my upper lid gold weights in patients with uh, <clears throat> lower lid uh, malposition. I don't like doing lateral tarsorophies. I find that cosmetically they look awful, uh, but I, I have done them in severe cases uh, combined with medial tarsorophies or pillar tarsorophies of which uh, uh, Richard Allen has some excellent videos if you're interested. Patients have had mid-face lifts performed um, uh, to help uh, lift the mid face and help the uh, lid position, uh, 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 including subopicularis fat repositioning and lateral canthopexies. Uh, you can perform temporalis muscle transfers uh, uh, as a facial reanimation technique, usually performed by the head and neck surgeons, where the insertion of the temporalis muscle is removed from its insertion on the mandible and attached to the orbicularis oris muscle, causing a facial lift. So this patient here did very well with this procedure. She was able to, you know, with a good Bell's phenomenon, protect her eye on gentle closure and on forced closure, there is now complete uh, lid closure um, with a well-hidden upper lid gold weight. Uh, with fifth nerve palsy, we are now referring patients for corneal neurotization. We have just started that service in Nova Scotia, a very interesting uh, uh, new procedure. Again, a, a very separate topic. Uh, and we've already talked about um, um, uh, medical treatment, including uh, corticosteroids and antivirals in the early phase of treatment. Orbital decompression has also been discussed for some patients, particularly by Richard Allen again. Uh, it can be performed for patients recalcitrant to uh, normal surgical options. Um, so the main complications we worry about, worry about of course, with the eye, uh, progressive keratopathy leading to ulceration and blindness, and also wasting of the facial muscles, which can result in facial asymmetry. Um, we are also now moving, you know, with oculofacial surgery away from the face. So this lady had a static sling placed to improve the position of her uh, side of her mouth uh, with a preauricular incision. And, you know, she looked great uh, with the position of the... Um, the sling, and she also had a lid surgery performed, and she was happy with that. So a very interesting um, uh, condition to manage. Uh, very important to be aware of the uh, differential diagnoses of facial nerve palsy, uh, as in the non-Bell's causes of FNP. And uh, uh, always be aware of, uh, you know, what the patient expects from their treatment and monitor these patients closely for complications uh, from the condition. Okay, and that is the end of that case. Thank you.